Thanks very much, Grace. Hello, everyone. Uh, my name's Callum, if we haven't met. Hello to my uh, SVF brothers and sisters who I've heard about, who meet at the late hour of four o'clock. Uh, I've been enjoying morning church. And uh, if you're new, uh, welcome. It's so good to have you. It's such a, a strange thing, isn't it, to come to church on a Friday. Uh, I keep thinking it's Monday tomorrow. Uh, but it's such a good thing to do together every year on this very, very good Friday. Uh, we're going to be thinking about the cross this morning as Paul describes it. Uh, but before we do that, I've got a little game to kind of wake us up a little bit, make sure we're all here. Uh, so it's a classic game if you ever go to trivia, but I'm going to put part of an icon on the screen. We'll do the first one. And we'll see if you guys can realize uh, what the icon is. Yeah, way up the back, big hand. It's McDonald's, that's right. The best restaurant in Australia, McDonald's. Uh, this, this icon was designed 71 years ago and not actually uh, originally coming from the M for McDonald's but from the arches of the very first restaurant that they ever made. The golden arches are as famous as the, the restaurant itself. All right, let's go to the next one. What do we think? Anyone, given, given the year it is, yeah? That's oh, right, it's the Olympic rings, well done. Yeah, there they are. Uh, the Olympic rings were created 111 years ago, each ring representing uh, one of the five inhabited continents. They put North and South America together for some reason, uh, and they're interlocking in a display of unity. Uh, next one, Let's see which ones, ah, oh, yes. Uh-huh. Yeah, anyone? Yeah, we'll go. Keep going. Go on a roll. Yeah, that's a Batman symbol. Uh, made 85 years ago uh, when Bruce Wayne thought, I'm going to take my greatest fear and embrace it and use it to fight justice. Uh, final, this one, we should all get this. <laughs> Yell it out. What is it? <laughs> it's not the New Zealand flag. It's the Australian flag. There it is. Uh, created 123 years ago, 1901, at the time of our federation, the Union Jack represents us. It is owned by the people. Uh, legally, you own this flag, everyone sitting in here. And the Union Jack represents the Commonwealth we're a part of. Uh, the star just underneath has six points uh, for the states, and then it, has, it just puts the territories together. They just get one point. Uh, and then the Southern Cross representing our geographical location, an icon that has stood for Australia for 123 years. The fact of the matter is the symbols and icons we use to represent ourselves, to represent things, have great meaning. And usually the things that we present are the things that we value most, the things that we're most proud of, what we want to be recognized and defined by. And it's no secret that the day we're gathering in church today has a symbol all of its own. Good Friday has a symbol that was instituted 2,000 years ago. In the Middle East, the symbol of Good Friday became the cross. More than that, it's become the symbol of the church, of the Christian faith, and of Jesus Christ himself. And ever since that Good Friday, crosses have been erected atop buildings, they've been cast into jewellery, scattered across graveyards, and even tattooed onto the skin of people. And yet the question is, what message do we hear when we see a cross? What message ought we to know when we come across a cross? Would you pray with me that today God would make it very clear to us what the message of the cross is, that it is the wisdom and power of God. Let's pray together. Heavenly Father, we thank you for your Son on this day of all days. Thank you for his death in our place. Heavenly Father, help us to know your wisdom and power from the foot of the cross this morning. And we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. So as you said, we're going to be looking at how the Apostle Paul talks about the cross in the first chapter of his letter to the Corinthian church. Uh, if, if you want to follow along, we're going to be doing that in three points. Uh, they're in your booklet, if you have it, if you'd like to take notes or follow 
how much longer is left of the sermon. Uh, And the three points are that the cross seems foolish, the cross is the wisdom of God, and the cross is the power of God. Can I also encourage you to have that Bible passage that Grace read out right next to the booklet as we'll be referring to it. But first of all, the cross can seem foolish. As Apostle Paul addressed the Corinthian church, he's ultimately writing to address problems and issues that they were facing. All throughout the letter, he brings up issues and addresses them and teaches them. And as we read there in verse 10, one of the issues Paul's Paul writes about is divisions forming within the Corinthian church. Paul writes this in verse 10. Have a look down there. He says, I appeal to you, brothers and sisters, by the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, that all of you agree and that there be no divisions among you and that you be united in the same mind and the same judgment. For it has been reported to me by Chloe's people that there is quarreling among you, my brothers. What I mean is that each one of you says, I follow Paul, or I follow Apollos, or I follow Cephas, or I follow Christ. As you read the letter of uh, 1 Corinthians, it becomes clear that the Corinthians have a pride issue. They're quarreling, and they're quarreling about all manner of things, but ultimately the common thread to all of these issues is that the Corinthians are trying to elevate themselves. They're trying to elevate themselves as high as they possibly can, and they're saying things like, no, I'm wiser, I'm holier, I'm more gifted, I'm better, and so on. And we see the Corinthians elevating themselves above each other as high as they possibly can. And we might think this sounds incredibly immature to read about a church having these kinds of quarrels, but I think we should be slow to judge them. Because I think, actually, we're not far off from thinking like this. We all think like this at various times of our life. And we need to see that we are not too dissimilar to the Corinthians for today's message to have any meaning for us. Because this is the context that Paul writes his words. He writes into that innate desire that all of us have to elevate ourselves as high as we possibly can. There is, after all, great immediate gain to be had from elevating ourselves, isn't there? Don't we often default in our everyday actions to kind of hide the things we're not too proud of, we're not too good at, and present the things that we know are our strengths, that we know make us look really, really good? I think this is why social media is so popular, because it allows you to do this so well. And we do it so that we might be as great as possible, gain recognition, credibility, respect, reputation. If you want to know your immediate kind of connection to the Corinthian condition, it's probably in the answer of the question, what is it that you boast in? What are you most proud of? How is it that you elevate yourself? How is it that you justify yourself as valuable and maybe even superior to those around you? I don't even think we do this uh, only individually, but actually collectively we are very prone to this, especially as of late. Since the enlightenment of the 17th and 18th period, our modern world has elevated human wisdom, human reason to be the ultimate source of authority. And we go now into the world and face its problems armed with our own reason. There is now no problem that we cannot tackle. There is no part of nature we cannot understand, no truth we cannot hope to find for ourselves. There is nothing that we will not one day be able to say, look what we have discovered. Everything now can be put under a microscope and examined. Everything can be put beneath us for us to adjudicate and rule on, and in many ways, this kind of thinking has led the Western world to totally discard God, religion, faith, faith in anything other than ourselves. We put forward our best people, our most impressive and our wisest people to discover for us, to teach us, and even at times to save us from the problems of this world. 
when Huey asked you to imagine someone who's impressive or wise, I wonder who it was that you thought of. Often I can work out someone is wise because I don't understand what they're saying, but it sounds good. That's how I work out someone's wise. But no doubt whoever you thought of, they were a great person. They were impressive and elevated. Now at this point, I want to be very clear. I want everyone to hear me clearly. I am not teaching and I'm not about to teach that the Bible is against scientific progress, against rational thought, logic, or even recognizing your strengths. In fact, in their right context, the Bible is very much for all these things. But today's passage does challenge our intuitive way of thinking and active, acting. It challenges that default intuition that we have in our hearts that says it is a wise thing for us to elevate ourselves as high as we possibly can. And it's especially challenging when we do this above God himself. And the way that it challenge us, challenges us here is with the cross of his son, Jesus Christ. Because as we consider the cross of Christ with this worldly framework, we'll see that it seems very, very foolish. In fact, with this framework, the cross looks like something that we should just totally give up on, stop thinking about, and let fade into security, into obscurity, sorry. Did you see it there in verse 18? This is very much what Paul says. He says, For the word of the cross is folly to those who are perishing. And in many ways, the cross is folly, foolishness. Because as much as when I Google images for the cross, I get like what you see behind me, beautiful carved pieces of work, on a hill with a hopeful sunrise in the background, the word of the cross in its proper context, in its historical context, appears far more gruesome. It appears far more hopeless and pathetic. In its proper context, the cross is nothing other than a Roman torture and execution device. It is the ancient equivalent of the guillotine, the electric chair, and the lethal injection not things that you would typically wear around your neck or get tattooed onto your skin. And Jesus himself, who hung upon the cross historically, was a refugee, a man who grew up in an ancient slum. He belonged to a conquered people who lived under a harsh Roman occupation. And for three years of his life, he spoke things that most people would say are just insane. Jesus spoke and said he was the son of God, He declared that he had come to earth so that people might know their creator. He said he was the way, the truth, and the life, and only by believing in him could people be saved. In response to his crazy message, his own people and the Romans banded together, and they responded by killing him in the most humiliating way possible, nailing him to a cross and hanging him between the worst kinds of criminals that society had to offer. They mocked him and they spat on him. His friends deserted him and there he hung and he died. This is Good Friday. This is the Good Friday that we are gathering to celebrate this morning. When I asked, when Huey asked you to think of someone impressive or wise, I doubt any of us thought of someone who was alone on death row. truth of the matter is the word of the cross is a long way from the story that we would write if we were God and if we were in charge and we could choose how is it that you want God to reveal himself to you when Jesus hung up on the cross uh, in Matthew 27 it will come up on the screen we read that someone yelled out if you are the son of God come down from the cross if you are the son of God come down from the cross and I find myself understanding this I get this person. Don't you agree? Like, if you are God, Jesus, what are you doing up there? If you're really God, this isn't how I think it should go. Rather, we say, Jesus, we want you to prove yourself to us. Reveal yourself in a much better way than coming and dying. And this request 
for proof is in our passage as well. Have a look at verse 22 there. In verse 22, Paul says that the Jews demand signs and the Greeks seek wisdom. This is what happens when we elevate ourselves above God. We like to think and vision God a bit like a dog at our feet, kind of pining for us to just believe in him. Please just show me some affection too. Often when we uh, consider preaching the gospel to people and asking them to believe, we, we can think that God is just desperately hoping maybe someone, someone will show me a little bit of attention. It's this kind of thinking about God that is totally wrong that leads us to say, God, I need you to prove yourself in the express way that I seem, I think, is most desirable, most efficient for me. We demand a sign. Or, like the Greeks, we can demand wisdom. We can think God must conform to every single rational thought that I have. And until I find a God that agrees with me on the ethics of right and wrong, until I find a God who will get in the box that I have created for him, until I find a God that can be the object of my own inquiry, I will not believe and I will not know him. When it comes to God, we can default so easily to demanding that he dances to the beat of our drum, plays the game by the rules that we want to enforce, and cater to the values that we have rather than the ones that he does. But the word of the cross does not endorse a self-elevating, humanistic wisdom of our world, but rather the complete opposite. If God has revealed himself in Jesus at the cross, he has chosen to reveal himself not in elevation, but in lowliness and humility. In the words of the passage, in foolishness. I meet more and more people these days who are very willingly open, and, uh, and this is probably all of us, uh, influence and follow people on social media. They, they change their whole weeks and lives so that they can uh, engage with a certain female singer who was touring recently. I'll leave you to work out who I'm talking about. But it's normal, right? These people are elevated and great. They're worth following. We don't bat an eyelid when people do these things. But increasingly, when someone in this world explains that they follow Jesus, that they change their lives to obey Jesus, to worship a man who died on a cross two millennia ago, increasingly it seems stupid. And they might humor Christians when they do this and pat them on the head and say, that's very cute, just go and do that in the corner over there. But in reality, the world thinks it's nonsense. It's crazy foolishness. And so the humiliating lowly word of the cross does seem so foolish by our own natural standards of wisdom. How on earth are we meant to believe in the cross? This brings us to our second point, that the cross is actually the wisdom of God. Let's read from verse 19 in our passage where Paul writes, For it is written, I will destroy the wisdom of the wise, and the discernment of the discerning I will thwart. Where is the one who is wise? Where is the scribe? Where is the debater of this age? Has not God made foolish the wisdom of the world? Sometimes when I'm very bored and uh, procrastinating, I like to go online and watch these things on YouTube. Uh, They're called forced perspective kind of uh, crayon drawings. There, There it is, yep. So what happens is the camera starts in one place and you watch someone do a chalk drawing. And it looks odd, like it looks off, the, as you can see, the shell's kind of at the wrong angle, the antenna of the snails, uh, crisscross, part of it's on a bench, it just looks wrong. But then what happens is the artist picks up the camera and moves it to another location. And this is what happens. And it makes a lot more sense. There's another one up there that The 
point of this is if we are to understand the cross properly, we need to move. We need to move away from our worldly evaluation of what is wise. And as we do, as we move in humility, we begin to see the beauty and indeed God's wisdom at the cross of his son, Jesus Christ. And Paul makes it very clear, God is very intentional that he has set it up this way. It is God's express wisdom that we cannot discover him through our own worldly, human-elevating wisdom. Read verse 21 with me very carefully. Verse 21 says, For since in the wisdom of God, the world did not know God through wisdom. For since in the wisdom of God, the world did not know God through wisdom, it pleased God through the folly of what we preach to save those who believe. The fact of the matter is God, being sovereign and all-powerful, could have stuck himself at the end of a mathematical formula for us to find him. Or he could have ordered the stars to spell out his existence so that we could find him with a telescope. Or Jesus could have come 2,000 years ago and hurled fire from his fists and called mountains to fall down on the Roman occupiers of his people so that we could be impressed with him, so that we could be approving of him. But here we see that, no, it pleased God to come by the way of the cross, the way of folly to mankind. We've already spoken about verse 22 there, for Jews demand signs and Greeks seek wisdom. And this morning, I cannot give you a sign from God. I cannot perform a miracle. I cannot give you a scientific proof, a formula, a logical argument that makes it crystal clear to you that God exists. But like Paul in verse 23, what I want to do and what I can do is point you to the cross of Jesus Christ. In verse 23, Paul says, but we preach Christ crucified, a stumbling block to Jews and folly to Gentiles. And this morning, my prayer is that you see the cross from the right perspective, from the right place, not from the place of human elevation where our wisdom says we need to sit above all things and look down and judge, but from the wisdom of God that says, humble yourself. Lower yourself. Don't look down upon Jesus, but come to the foot of the cross and look up. The cross does not proclaim that mankind ought to be elevated, but rather that mankind is lowly and sinful, that mankind needs saving but cannot save themselves. Throughout his ministry, Jesus taught unequivocally that if you or I or anyone else were to appear before God, the record of our wrongs, the ways we fail to honour God as creator and love our neighbour beside us would render us worthy of eternal judgment. Often the way that we elevate ourselves is not just to present what we do well, but actually to hide all of our sins, all of our weaknesses. And there is a common example that is very powerful where I want you to imagine I had a USB in my hand. And on this USB was a video of everything you've ever looked at. And in a Word file, all your thoughts have been dictated. And in an audio file, everything you've ever said. And I want you to imagine I had your USB and I had it plugged in to present on the screen behind me. And we could do a little control F and we could look for how you speak about people when they're not listening. Or the things you do when you think no one is watching. The thoughts that come into your mind where you think it is safe and secret. The thoughts you would never put up on Facebook as a status. But the fact of the matter is God knows it all. We sinful beings, and I can say this confidently about everyone, myself included, the billions of people who have existed over the years and years of history, we sinful beings all know deep in our heart that we fall very short of our own standard, let alone God's holy standard. 
And here is the wisdom of God for you. Here is the wisdom of God in the cross. That rather than using this knowledge of our USB to crush us, to maximize the distance between us and him, which is what we would do if we had this USB, I think. We would immediately start to think ourselves better. Rather than God doing that and to just scrap his creation and start again as he has every right to as our creator, at the cross of Jesus Christ, God shows a different way, a different wisdom. Another letter to another church, Paul writes these words from Philippians 2. It's going to come up on the screen. Have a, have a listen to them. Paul writes that Jesus, though he was in the form of God, did not count equality with God a thing to be grasped, but emptied himself by taking the form of a servant, being born in the likeness of men, and being found in human form. He humbled himself by becoming obedient to the point of death, even death on a cross. In his son, Jesus Christ, God does not elevate, but humbles himself all the way to join us and become the lowest member of our lowly human race. And on the cross, he declares a very countercultural truth. The cross declares that this is what humanity deserves. Not elevation, but punishment. But Jesus says, I who did no sin will take their place. I will humble myself to death on a cross. And so to understand the cross and to know God through the cross, we need one thing and one thing only. Not science, not maths, not philosophy or any other lofty wisdom of our age that would cause us to boast. No, we need only know that we are sinners. We need only know that we are sinners. And as soon as we accept that we are sinners, we will be standing in the right place to see the cross of Christ properly with the wisdom of God. This is exactly what Paul says in our passage in verse 26 there. He asked the Corinthians to consider themselves who know the cross and whether they are really that great. He says, for consider your calling, brothers. Not many of you were wise according to worldly standards. Not many were powerful. Not many were of noble birth. If it were true, as we would desire, that God is to be found through the greatness of our own intellect, then only the smartest of us would ever find him. If God were deep in some philosophical thought, then only the incredible, incredibly logical would ever find him. But with the wisdom of God at the cross, anyone, anyone in the world, from the late Stephen Hawking to a child with a learning disability, can all come to see their own sin and come humbly to the foot of the cross in faith and there know God. And there see the beauty of his wisdom through his son's humble sacrifice. How much better the wisdom of God is, how much more beautiful it is. There's a very old, famous song. Uh, it's not on the slides, but I'll read it out for you. The lyrics say this. It says, You may own earth's silver, have riches untold, but all of earth's wealth, my friend, won't save your soul. You may live in a mansion, or the world knows your name, but at the foot of the cross, my friend, everyone stands the same. The ground is level at the foot of the cross. Anyone may come there, there is no cost. Rich man or poor man, bonded or free, the ground was leveled that day at Calvary. The ground is level at the foot of the cross. I hope now you can see why the attitude, the Corinthian attitude of division and self-elevation stands in direct conflict with the word of the cross of Jesus Christ. For God has been very intentional in how he has chosen to reveal himself to this world. In verse 28 there, Paul writes, God chose what is low and despised in the world, even things that are not, to bring to nothing things that are, so that no human being might boast in the presence of God. This brings us to our third point. It's the shortest, you'll be happy to hear. Uh, 
and it's the power, the cross is the power of God. And if you're starting to doze off, this would be a great time to come back in and just listen up, uh, because the final good news of Friday is this, is that when we shift our perspective, we ditch worldly wisdom in our approach to God, and we come not elevated, but humble, from judge of God to one judged by God, and we see the cross for its beauty. It's not just an artwork that looks good. It's not just a wisdom to ponder. It's not just something that we view and think about, but rather it is something that reaches back out to us and has power and actually changes the trajectory of our whole lives forever. There is a very real power in the cross of Christ. It is actually this power that frames our entire passage. I think it's Paul's whole point. Uh, If you look there in verse 18, it's there. It says, for the word of the cross is folly to those who are perishing, but to us who are being saved, it is the power of God. And then right at the end, chapter 2, verse 5, over the page, you'll see that it says, so that your faith might not rest in the wisdom of men, but in the power of God. What is this very real power of God at the cross? It is God's power for salvation. God's power to save a sinful people who would gather there at the foot of the cross. God's power, specifically, Paul says, gives us three things in Jesus. If you have a look there in verse 30 in the passage, it it lists them out. It says it gives us righteousness, sanctification, and redemption. If those words don't mean a lot to you, that's all right. What Paul is essentially saying is righteousness. At the foot of the cross, your USB that he knows all about is crushed, deleted, burnt up, and destroyed. Though God knows every single thing that is on there, he offers complete forgiveness. So that that pit in your heart at the thought of your USB being displayed is totally dealt with. Righteousness. Sanctification. That anyone who humbly stands at the foot of Jesus' cross and puts their faith in him God will work a power in their lives to transform them. The promise is that he will remove sin from their lives, one day making them fit to exist with him in heaven. And finally, redemption. That God has bought you at a price. With the blood of his son, he has made you his own prized possession that he will never let go. The cross is God's powerful display of victory over sin and the death and punishment that we deserve. All the things that make us feel shameful, unworthy, all those things we try and hide, God takes them and at the cross of Jesus Christ, he deals with them once and for all and saves us for all eternity. The power of the cross is this, that if you come and you put your faith in Jesus' death for you, you can be confident that you can appear before the almighty, all-perfect God with absolutely no fear whatsoever. This is the wisdom and the power of cross of the very first Good Friday. It's the Good Friday that we are celebrating today. This is the message that has caused the Christian faith the icon of the bloody, foolish cross to explode across the globe, to define the history books in the calendar. It's what's made Jesus, who was for a time the lowest of the low, the most famous name in our world today. Let me end by summarizing and just challenging us once again from verse 18. It's how I would sum up this uh, sermon this morning, that there is essentially two messages. Is Jesus Christ, believing in him as the crucified saviour of the world, is it foolish to you? If it looks like nonsense, the Bible warns you that that is actually a sign you are perishing. You should know that you stand before the wrath of God, fully accountable for every single thing you have done wrong. And if that is you, I want to stress that I do not say these things thinking I'm any better than you, any smarter, any wiser, but rather a sinner myself. 
And in the words of William Temple, I would not tell you to go to the cross, but rather to come to the cross, where we ourselves have found our salvation by the power of the gospel. The second person, and I hope this is most of us today, is that when we see the cross, we see it is God's wisdom. It is God's perfect way of revealing himself and God's perfect power for saving us from our sin. And if that is you, let me, let me encourage you to see the cross this Friday as a comfort for everything that lies ahead. You are safe, you are loved, you are a cherished possession, and you have been cleaned of all you've done wrong. Needless to say, when we put crosses on our buildings and around our necks, we as Protestants leave that cross empty. Because the truth of the gospel is Jesus did not stay dead, but rose again. Can I encourage you, especially if you don't regularly join us, come back on Easter Sunday. Come and hear the rest of the story, the good news about Jesus' resurrection from the dead, the promise of new life for ourselves. But for now, as we dwell on the cross on Good Friday, let me finish with these amazing words from this famous hymn. Amazing grace. How sweet the sound that saved a wretch like me. I once was lost, but now am found. Was blind, but now I see. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you that you have decreed it so that no one will boast before you. That to come before your cross in humility is the only way to know you. We pray that you would help us to know our sin, but all the more know the grace of the Lord Jesus Christ who died for us. Give us confidence in his cross, and we pray this in his holy and awesome name. Amen.